Welcome. I'm Father Mitch Pacwa, and welcome to EWTN Live. We're bringing you guests from around the world. And tonight, we will speak with a Catholic writer and professor who teaches other writers to bring out their Christ-centered imagination. He helps them dramatize the ways that grace affects nature and shows how visual images point to unseen realities. Through this, he hopes to give Catholic writers and their readers a deeper understanding of the power of the story to lead them closer to Jesus Christ. So please welcome the co-founder of the Masters of Fine Arts Creative Writing Program at the wonderful University of St. Thomas in Houston in the Republic of Texas. He is also the author of a book, How to Read and Write Like a Catholic. Welcome, Dr. Joshua Hren. It's pure joy to be here with you, Good Father. to Thank have you. So much. you. Yeah. Good to have you here. <laughs> this is um, something that we haven't done too much of, but uh, I, th I think is a good thing. Uh, I've done programs about church architecture, sure. church music, yeah. and you know painting and such, but haven't done quite enough on the importance of Catholic literature mm. and reading literature with a Catholic. I. Mm -hmm. That's mm -hmm. something that you do. Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, so I mean, one of the, the things that, that we do with literature is really just show that life has a narrative form, right? It has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And there's a way in which, as, as Alistair McIntyre, the philosopher at Notre Dame says, right, if you, if you run out of good stories to tell, or if you're telling the wrong kinds of stories, you can feel like life is kind of drying up, right? And he actually says this is one of the ways that you know that someone is nearing a kind of dark place in their lives or despair is that they have this sense of the story is running out, right? It's sort of at an end. Mm. And mm -hmm. so stories are, are, are especially important in, in, a, in, a, in a kind of a dire time like ours, right? Because they can imagine various possibilities that for many people, because they might not have a really active imagination, might be sort of beyond their purview or beyond their access. Um, and of course, we all, I think we all know that stories are important because we tell them to our children, right? I was just recently reading The Odyssey of Homer to my son. I've read it to my children multiple how, times. How old is your son? He's 10 now. He started getting it probably at age six. Mm -hmm. Poor kid. <laughs> but... Um, there's this wonderful scene where Odysseus has been away from home for 20 and years. So folks understand, Odysseus yeah. is the hero of the book called The Odyssey. The Odyssey. It's named after him. You got it. Yep. Written by the blind poet Homer and one of the greatest poems ever written. Uh, and so Odysseus is trying to make his way home. He's a war veteran. He fought for 10 years. He's been trying to get home for another 10 and various obstacles have been forbidding that homecoming and that return. So he's really eager to make it back. And at this one part of the story, he's just gotten through visiting the underworld. So he's literally just left hell. And he finds that instead of being able to take a shortcut home after that, he has to pass through Scylla and Charybdis. And Circe, who is a kind of witch figure actually, mm -hmm. who's kept him hostage, she gives him the advice that he should go towards Scylla because Scylla he has a six-headed creature, and he has many, many men. And if he goes by Scylla, only six of his men will be killed. Whereas if he goes the other direction, which is this monster Charybdis, she'll suck the whole boat down into the depths of the sea, and all of his men will be wiped out. Yes. So I'm reading this with my son, and he said to me, you know, I, w I wonder if Odysseus is going to tell his companions, his men who are traveling with him, about these monsters that they're about to face or whether they'll just sort of, he'll be quiet about it and they'll just face it as they reach it, right? And they'll have to make a quick decision. And then right after that, the poem Homer himself says, Odysseus chose not to tell his men mm -hmm. because he was worried 
that if he told them about these terrible monsters, they would freeze up in fear and they would not be able to row anymore and all of them would perish. Uh, but it was remarkable to me because it showed that in my son's mind, right, that imaginative figure sort of made him think on a strategic level, right? It made him think about things like, we ended up having this conversation about leadership and transparency. Should you tell the truth to those who you're ruling or leading at all times? You have to tell them the whole truth or are there things that you should prudentially kind of keep quiet? Um, and so not only was he exhilarated by these curious monsters and it was just a sort of a delight, but there's also instruction. And so this goes into right, Horace's famous sort of dictum that the best stories are those that both delight and morally instruct us at the same time. And I think that you know everything from from Homer onward does that, but it does that <clears throat> oftentimes by means of analogy, right? Mm -hmm. So most of us, I presume, maybe you could tell me different after your stories about hunting swine earlier, uh, you know, maybe, maybe you have had experiences facing Scylla and Charybdis, but most of us won't, but there are sort of metaphorical or analogical mm -hmm. stand-ins for those kinds of dilemmas in our life where we can't say, well, I'm gonna avoid these two difficult situations and choose the really pleasant one. We have two difficult situations and we have to choose one or the other, right? So I think that right, it develops the moral imagination in a very natural way in that sense. You see, that's one of the great things about literature is that um, it, uh, it really does give us an imaginative sense by which I can use somebody from the past yes. or from imagination yes. and the situations they were in. And I use that as a filter to start thinking through my life. That's right. That's why we read stories and why they're good for us. That's right. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And so there's a, there's a kind of a whole range of reasons, I think, why Catholics ought to read literature. And the way that I put it is that Catholic approach to literature kind of swings on this pendulum between what St. John Henry Newman, the only sainted novelist, uh, calls the record of man in rebellion, mm -hmm. which is his idea that literature is primarily a record of human sinfulness. And he takes that approach because he's trying to give an account not of Christian literature or Catholic literature, but of literature per se, just every work of literature that has ever been or could be written. And his idea is that, of course, if we, if we go that route, we can't say that it's all focused on grace or the sacramental imagination, as you said, of using the seen to see the unseen, but rather a study of man in rebellion and at its best, he says, a study of the virtues of natural man, mm -hmm. right? And so on the one hand, we have that approach and that could justify why even a Catholic or Christian can find a lot of good things in Homer, even though Homer was you know, far from Christian, he was existing in a world before Christian revelation, right? right? But he understood human nature deeply, right? And he rendered it very compellingly, mm -hmm. struggles with pride, right? Uh, uh, the, the longing and the pains of homecoming, right? As we were talking about a little while ago. Um, so that's sort of Newman's idea. But I actually think, f please forgive me, St. John Henry Newman, I think that he, 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 he pushes that angle a little bit too hard, right? Because he, he basically rules out the possibility of a literature that could imagine grace. He says that you can't have a sinless literature of sinful man, right, is the famous line. And what, what does he mean by that? You cannot have a sinless literature of sinful man. What does that mean? Right. So the way that he puts it is literature, in his understanding, is a realistic imitation of people as they are. Mm -hmm. In his, one of his best lines, which is really salient, is literature helps us to take things as they are, not as we would want them to be, right? Mm -hmm, right. So it helps us to sort of do away with these sentimental or rosy-eyed notions that we oftentimes, we make up, we falsify our lives, right? Oftentimes we falsify our own understanding of ourselves, thinking ourselves greater or worse than we really are, our friends. And even and when we're not politicians, we yeah, do that. that's true. Yeah, we love to point out when politicians do it, but it's a lot harder when that finger, right? Yes, goes exactly. Goes back and, and hits, hits yourself in the chest, yeah. So, um, so, so what he means though is that, right? He says, if you want, if you want a literature that represents saints, 
you have to first have a nation of them, is the way that he puts it. So again, he's, he's working in kind of these extremes. Mm -hmm. of your, you got sort of a record of man in rebellion over here, or you, got these, you, you have this future eschatological age where there will be this world of saints, and then you can write stories that are sinless or less focused on sin. Right now, this is one of the reasons I think that people struggle with literature and why a lot of Catholics would rather read devotional books or lives of the saints than read literature. As Tolstoy famously said, right, you know, all happy families are alike, but every unhappy family is unhappy in their own particular way, right? And so his point was, I I'm sorry, I can't tell you, you know, a totally happy story in Anna Karenina, right? right. Uh, it's gonna be a difficult, harrowing, kind of painful story. Um, and so I, I think a, a lot of Catholic readers, uh, you know, struggle with that. Sometimes, of course, it's, it's justified, right? Because especially in, in a post-Christian world, especially in a post-modern world, the secular age, right? If you talk about representations of human sinfulness, right, without a sense of God and of modesty and of sort of knowing when to restrain your imitation of really difficult and ugly things, you get just grotesque in the, in the worst possible sense. And I think we rightfully should stay away from that kind of sinful literature. So, you know, basically think movies that are graphic to the point of pornographic, same thing with literature, right? Though, and, there's no justification for and, that. And the, the, you know, we can see a change in many of the movies that, that are out there uh, where in the 30s and 40s, there were killings that took place. Sure but they were off camera. Yeah. You saw the shooter with a gun, but you didn't see the goriest details right. of it. Right. Whereas when you get to the time of Tarantino yeah. and other directors, where they show the, mm. this horrible, mm. uh, gory mm -hmm. scene uh, of, of shootings and, and such, mm. which in, in, mm. it's not that shooting somebody should ever be glorified, it shouldn't. Sure. And it's not in the old movies. Mm. It usually leads to being punished mm -hmm. for, for the crime mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. in some way or other. Mm -hmm. But uh, it can be not only pornographic in regard to sex, right. but it can be sure. in, in terms of violence, yeah. a, another type, not exactly pornography, but yeah. it is obscene. No, there's, there's a lot of truth to that. And it, you know, it, on the one hand, you have Aristotle in his Poetics. He says one of the reasons that we know that we're imitative creatures by nature, we imitate other people, just that's one of the fundamental things that make us human, right? We right. imitate our mothers when we're little, that's how we learn. Uh, and he says that we know this, especially in the case of art, because we, we relish well-made imitations of ugly things, right? Mm -hmm. So I don't think that it's right necessary for, for art to be good to have to imitate beautiful things and beautiful realities. And actually, you know, you mentioned earlier, uh, the, the discussion of Catholic arts oftentimes gravitates towards architecture and visual arts. And I think that part of the reason for that is because those things are more innately and intrinsically beautiful, right, than mm -hmm. literature. Mm -hmm. Whereas it's not that literature is not beautiful, but that beauty is mi mingled and mixed with that sort of human sinfulness, right? To, so to go back to the, you know, the, 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 the re sort of nervousness or maybe rejection of literature that I was describing on, on the part of a lot of Christians or Catholics, um, you know, I think part of their reluctance is they want some sort of beauty, but they also want a shortcut to that beauty. They want kind of happiness and oftentimes want it relatively cheaply delivered. I think that, uh, you know, when we're, when we're thinking about, let's say, watching a tragedy, say King Lear, right, mm -hmm. by Shakespeare, Here's a tragedy about a familial relationship that none of us would wish upon one another or our worst enemies, right? I mean, mm -hmm. the children and the father are at enmity and at odds for much of the play, right? But the amazing thing about the way that Shakespeare registers that tension is that he doesn't lead you to kind of scorn the characters he actually leads you to mourn the ways in which you have come close to imitating their own sinfulness and right, mm -hmm. their own flaws. Um, and 
there's a way in which, right, literature that registers that sinfulness, which oftentimes take the, takes the form of a tragedy, right, where there's not a kind of a happy ending, we think that what we'd want was for all of them to kind of reconcile and unify by the end of the story, because that's what we would want in our lives. But actually, in the case of literature, it's a really good thing that the playwright or the poet continues to push through to that harrowing ending because we can then follow through the consequences of our own perspective sins to what it would look like if we don't get our house in order. You yep. know? So I always say the amazing thing is after watching King Lear, I'm a better father for at least four days <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> because, right, because of watching that sort of play out and seeing ways in which I could kind of become like that myself if I'm not careful, right? Mm -hmm. Whereas if I would have watched him maybe reconcile, I might not be as motivated to make those changes. So it's, it's a kind of unexpected, mysterious effect mm -hmm. that it has on us in that way. But it brings out something else. Well, yeah. this family that is in free fall collapse, yeah. you know, and, and violent danger among themselves. Yes. While that's going on in King Lear, you also, it's, the other thing that you said is that you present that which is ugly and sinful in human nature mm. in a beautiful way mm -hmm. because it's mm -hmm. profoundly beautiful mm -hmm. yeah. literature. He writes, Shakespeare writes, yeah the English language superbly. Yeah. And he improves us by that beautiful presentation mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. of something that is evil. It doesn't make it attractive. No, right. It doesn't make you want to no, have yeah. family jealousy that right. leads to mm -hmm. catastrophe. Mm -hmm. but or to justify your own, right. your own weaknesses. It's not right. his goal, yeah. but he does make it beautiful. Mm -hmm. In, in the plastic arts, someone like Michelangelo makes the death of Christ mm. and the pathos of his blessed mother. Mm. Uh, someone, a, a scene that is so beautiful in the Pietà. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. He does with marble, mm -hmm. making it beautiful, mm. even though it's a it's, horrible yeah. scene. Right. But he makes it beautiful with marble the way Shakespeare makes yeah. the tragedy of Lear Beautiful. Yeah, it's really, a, it's, it's an ability to extract from this very difficult situation, the good that's happening there that most of us would not be able to see clearly without the artist, right? Wow. So most of us, as the early Christians did, would just look at it in horror and run away, right? But the art helps us to enter into it, right? Yep. Um, yeah, so I mean, so on the one hand, you have that sort of justification, which is Newman's argument. And again, there's a lot of, there's a lot of good there and a lot of weight. But then on the other hand, on the other end of the sort of pendulum, right, if we swing all the way over, we have the beatific vision, right? Art as able to represent for us the souls of the blessed looking at God. And of course, the place that we find that is in Dante's paradise. Mm -hmm. And he has this beautiful image of the souls of the blessed like bees buzzing around on the mystical rose, right? And, and beholding, right, God himself. Mm -hmm. And so I think that Catholic literature, as you said, in its sacramental dimension, it takes seen things and shows us unseen realities, right, mm -hmm. by them. But it also, in the case of that other end of the pendulum of showing us paradise, right, it, it reveals to us unseen things with visible realities, right? Mm -hmm. So with analogies that we're familiar with, right? All of us know what bees look like, right? We, no, none of us have been to paradise. Yeah. Uh, and, and, yet, and yet there's also a sort of, there's, a, there's also another revelation that comes when Dante gets right to the top of the celestial sphere. So he's climbed the heavens, right? He's made his way out of hell through purgatory. He's climbing the celestial spheres up to the top. And then he looks back for a brief moment back upon the earth and all of the struggles that he was so caught up in as though it's the only world that existed, right? And he, and he sees it, in the words of the poem, as a mere threshing floor, right? Mm -hmm. This thing that he thought was the ultimate reality. You know, mm -hmm. this world is all there is, right? All of us can fall into living like that, especially mm -hmm. in a secular age. And literature corrects that inclination not just through poems like Dante's Divine Comedy, but through 
any number of stories in modern fiction, right? Because much of it involves stories of conversion, right? And as Flannery O'Connor said, and she's sort of the, the middle ground between Dante and his beatific vision and Newman and his record of man and rebellion, Flannery O'Connor said that most of her stories are about characters who are experiencing the action of grace, but who are not very willing to support it, right? They're very reluctant to receive that grace. Yes. And as I always say, like, doesn't that, isn't that a, a, a beautiful description of most of our lives, right? Yes. I mean, God is always good, so good, and always giving us more than we receive, right? Uh, but she, she sort of defends then, both in her essays and in her stories, the way in which grace acts upon nature. So her characters, right, are very different in, in their natures. On the one hand over here, you have the misfit who's a serial killer, right, in one of her stories. On the other hand, you have this kind of cranial guy whose name is Mr. Head. Uh, he lives up to the name. And the way in which Grace has to operate on the serial killer is very different than the way it's going to operate on the intellectual guy, right? When the grace comes at the end of this story on Mr. Head, it operates on his thoughts, right? And Flynn O'Connor renders this. It, it, it shows him in the process of recalibrating his entire way of thinking, right, at the, at the end through this epiphany. Um, and, right, that's what literature allows us to see is that interior shift, Right. In a way that is, you know, especially even more so than drama can uh, and even more so than the epic did. Modern fiction really takes this turn inside in, in an attempt to kind of really represent the soul. Right. The mm -hmm. souls of characters. Mm -hmm. um, sometimes, you know, in the, in, in the case of some characters, they're souls that are very difficult to abide in. Right. But sometimes they're absolutely detestable. Yeah, that's true. But even in those cases. Right. As Jacques Martin says what Catholic writers can do, what they can bring to the table that other writers cannot, is they can represent that evil or that detestability, right, at the right altitude, right? So he says in Art and Scholasticism, there's this wonderful passage where he basically says, you know, a lot of literature can get too caught up in the problem of evil. And actually St. John Paul II in his letter to artists said that that's a, a sort of a point of common ground and reproachment between Christian writers and sort of most modern writers, even if they're atheists, is this preoccupation with the problem of evil. But again, sometimes that evil is represented in, in a kind of gloating way, as we were talking about earlier with the films. But what the Catholic writer can do is show that it's not just this sort of natural reality, that we have souls and that those, the, the deepest levels of evil, right, we're actually acting in outright rebellion, not against our fellow man or against ourselves, but against God himself, mm -hmm. right? So Maritain's way of resolving this question of the problem of representing evil is not whether you should do it. He says, you know, that's not the question. It's at what altitude, right, you should do it. Mm -hmm. And in order by, to get at the, the sure, altitude, yeah. What is it he means by that? That's a great question. Yeah. Yeah. So, right, because what he, well, let's say what he doesn't mean is that you want to treat the problem of evil in the mode of a scientist who's sort of objectively on the outside of it, right? Sort of mm -hmm. to the point that you're not actually feeling it. You're not in there in the emotional, right? So much of literature is about educating our emotions, right? Mm -hmm. And so it doesn't mean sort of studying it uh, in this detached way. Uh, but what it means especially is, as he says, purifying the source. So any Catholic writer needs to take seriously the, the life of the soul and to undergo a constant conversion themselves if they're going to rightly render the conversions of characters in their stories, yeah. right? They have to purify themselves through the sacraments, right, and take that very seriously. And those who don't are likely to represent evil at the wrong altitude, right? So they're gonna sort of connive with that evil. They're gonna be sort of participators mm -hmm. in it, if that makes sense, as mm -hmm. opposed to sort of calling it what it is. Right? What, one of the things that I oftentimes suspect is that you know, uh, Catholics bring their faith in God who gives them the altitude, he gives them 
the perspective yeah. on human life yes. that oftentimes atheists don't. I, I, I think of a, a, a number of people who do jokes that are comedians. Yeah. When they're atheists, whatever funny stuff they have fades quickly because they don't have mm -hmm. a perspective right. on human life that comes from God. And after a while, <laughs> they, without perspective, they have to go for the cheapest, easiest jokes, usually in the sexual realm. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's cheap. Mm -hmm. yeah, sure. It's just, right. you know, the, the sophomores in high school come up with that. Right, right. Whereas, you know, folks who really mm. are funny Mm. have perspective on themselves mm. first mm -hmm. and then on life in general. Mm -hmm. That's right. And that, that's why in the past so many comedians have been Jewish mm. and Christian <laughs> believers. <laughs> Absolutely. Because they have perspective. I think that's true in literature. Absolutely. Yeah. That having this perspective on human beings mm -hmm. that without which uh, I, well, I think of uh, a very famous atheist uh, philosopher, Jean-Paul Sartre, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. in his book, uh, it's, it's a play, No Exit, he comes to the conclusion, man is hell, mm -hmm. you know, and mm -hmm. he, he can't mm -hmm. see his way out. That's mm -hmm. why it's no exit right. yeah. from the misery of other people. That's right. Yeah. Uh, That's absolutely right. Yeah, right. When, to go back to Alistair McIntyre's point that I mentioned earlier, right? That's what he's talking about: is these narratives that basically present there being no exit, right? And oftentimes that happens, right? When you move away from the Christian vision, as you said, and so it's interesting because when you think about the the sort of the genres in relationship to the Christian revelation or the Christian vision, right? When I say the genres, I mean, let's, yeah. like, let's say tragedy and comedy especially, right? Yeah, These are, um, a genre is a certain form mm -hmm. of literature. Yeah, it's a sort of shape that the yeah. story takes. Yeah, exactly. And, uh, you know, in, in his book, uh, Mimesis, Eric mm -hmm. Auerbach, who Great is, book. yeah, it's an amazing, <laughs> it's an amazing book. Uh, in, in Mimesis, he sort of shows that, that comedy, right, allows us access into the lower echelons of life, right? So the riffraff, the deplorables, right? Uh, tragedies, not willing to sort of condescend into that because it narrates a sort of a regal action, typically in a regal diction, an elevated diction, right? Speaking in a way that most of us would never talk, right? So that's the way that the characters in tragedy speak because they're dealing with something that's very significant and sober-minded, right? Um, uh, sort of a literary yeah. version of drama queens. <laughs> for sure, yeah, they could be. They could take that shape for sure. Um, so, yeah, but uh, but he points out that even though comedy, right before Christianity, was able to take the lower echelons seriously enough to imitate them, mm -hmm. right? Let's say Petronius's novel, The Satyricon, right, or an ancient Roman novel. Um, what it was not able to do is to treat common people with a kind of love and seriousness, right? So it was able to sort of mock them. It put them on the stage, but only to kind of have fun with them at, and oftentimes at their own expense. Yeah, ri Whereas using ridicule it, yeah. rather than a, a, a sense of humor by which you're laughing with somebody. Sure. yeah, exactly. And enjoying it. That's right. Whereas uh, with the gospels, he says the gospels kind of explode literary genres. Mm -hmm. Right. And he uses the scene of Peter's denial. Right. In ancient literature, even representing a, a minor figure like Peter, a fisherman. Pff, right. He should barely even show up on stage. And if he does show up, he's going to be, again, roundly sort of satirized. Mm -hmm. But in the gospel, Peter, of course, he denies our Lord. But if we zo zoom out for a moment, right, what we see happening in that moment is that Peter's decisions, even though he's a nobody, right, have the, have, are tipping the scales of eternity, right? The vertical mm -hmm. of the divine is totally intersecting with this horizontal world where, you know, Jesus comes and eats fish, right, with his disciples, where when the Son of God is born, there's a sort of 
you know, there's, there's an ox and there are, there, there are cows, you know, uh, relieving themselves right next to his head. I mean, I don't mean to yeah. be too frank, but I mean, this is the truth, right? Yeah. And so, yeah, William Lynch, uh, the Jesuit William Lynch in Christ and Apollo, says that Christianity is also fundamentally comic, even if you just think about the idea that God created us out of nothing, right? Mm. He created us out of this clay. From a certain angle, there's something pretty funny about that, right? I mean, it's, it's almost bizarre. It's, too, yeah. it's, it's so bizarre that it's almost hard to believe that it's true, right? But it is. And that helps us not to take ourselves too seriously, right? So one of the things that uh, Lynch also gets at is that Judas is the ultimate non-comic figure, right? Because he is unable to not take himself so seriously that he can't get away from the, the idea that what he did is unforgivable, right? Yeah. Um, and you know where that, that yeah. leads him, right? It leads to suicide. In fact, going back to Sartre, he says that throughout his life, he struggled regularly not to kill himself. Yeah. He had, he, Mm. Everything was the serious mm. existential mm -hmm. right. uh, uh, feeling that, he, in fact, we use the word ennui mm -hmm. to right. mean this anxiety mm -hmm. that he used as a basis for mm. uh, one of the key concepts of his philosophy. Because yeah. he took himself so seriously. Right. Only at the, I don't know if you knew this, but at the end of his life, yes. he became a Catholic again. Now, he, I've heard, he, yeah, I've heard he went, sort of different uh, concepts. Dominican yeah. priest Interesting. heard his confession. Yeah. Gave him the last rites, regularized his marriage yeah. with Simone de Beauvoir. Yeah. Uh, and huh. uh, he re received the sacraments. You know died. who else received the sacraments at the end of his life? Oscar Wilde. Did he? And, yes, and, yes, yes. And he actually famously quipped, of course, as he would with his typical wittiness, right, that Catholicism is the only religion to die in. Right? Yes. So, right, because you get all of these wonderful, ornate last rites. Yeah. Um, yeah. We have to take a little break. Uh, we're going to come back. I urge you to check out the Master of Fine Arts Creative Writing Program at the University of St. Thomas in Houston, Texas. You can do that by going to S-T-T-H-O-M, so St. Tom, dot E-D-U, S-T-Tom, T-H-O-M, dot E-D-U. And you can find out more about this program and uh, learn more about how you, how you can read literature and find depths of meaning for our Catholic life in this literature. And it's a great, great thing that, that based on the book uh, that we have by Professor Hren, uh, it would be a good thing to take a look at. We'll be back in a couple of minutes, so please stay with us. Are discussing a really fine book I enjoyed quite a well, quite a bit called How to Read and Write Like a Catholic by Joshua Hren. Now of course you can get this at EWTNRC.com. It is item number 8667. And I, I recommend this as a good way to start. And it, something about the book that I, I thought was uh, fascinating is the way that you go through quite a number of different authors mm -hmm. and different pieces of literature. It's as if you're giving us a bit of a Catholic way to mm -hmm. read mm -hmm. this literature in the book. You're showing us mm -hmm. here, here's some of the things to look for in this writer and this writer and this writer. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely right. So the first part of the book is really sort of dividing the Catholic approaches that we talked about a little bit earlier, yes. right? But then once I've established that way of reading, I try to really just sort of embody it in essays that do really careful and close readings of different texts. And those texts range from some authors who are Catholic, right, Catholic writers, and some of them are the kind of the usual suspects. So, 
You know, you have Evelyn Waugh, Flannery O'Connor. Mm -hmm. I have a, a chapter on Walker Percy in there. But so I also, a, a number of them are them, themselves converts. That's right. Yeah. Like Evelyn Waugh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And Walker Percy. <laughs> yeah, and as as some of Evelyn Waugh's friends, you know, pointed out to him, you're, you you really are a, a Catholic, really, because he was a very cranky and sort of mean spirited man, and of course. He said, well, you, you, you should be grateful I am Catholic. I'd be far worse if I wasn't, right? <laughs> um, so yeah, I mean, so some of them are the usual suspects that I cover, but then I also have a section that's devoted to Christ-haunted fictions, right? So looking at authors who were maybe Catholic for a time, uh, like Hemingway, mm -hmm. uh, but they fell away, and sort of hunting in their stories for the ways in which that sacramental imagination, that hauntedness with the hound of heaven right over their shoulders or at mm -hmm. their heels right that he's still there and he's still hounding them in their stories even mm -hmm. when they've sort of sworn him off there's a contemporary uh, novelist who's sort of a really big deal in terms of the literati of our our national literary culture right now named george saunders mm -hmm. he's sort of a self-styled christian buddhist um, and right the one, one on the one hand you could say well if he's going to go for in for that kind of syncretism, we might as well just sort of leave him to the dogs and not take his fiction seriously. But I think it's really important, in Newman's words, to learn how to separate the precious from the vile. Right? Mm. It's such a wonderful line. And to do so, you have to read in a manner that's charitable, right? but that is not sort of overly sympathetic, right? just for the sake of kind of tolerating and mm -hmm. there is a fine line between those two things, and they are very different. One's a virtue and one's a vice, right? But I try to sort of model what that might look like. So in the case of George Saunders, the interesting thing is that he, he attributes his artistic life, his turn to art, to being a writer, to the mass of his youth. When he was a child, he attended, he says, Latin mass, and he learned the importance of symbolism. And he makes this wonderful comparison between the mass and any good art, right? The way that Flaubert puts it is every writer needs to find le mot just, right? So the, the, the just word, every word in a story should be earned. There should be nothing superfluous. And the way that Saunders puts it is, isn't that the way that the mass works, mm -hmm. right? The mass is the source and summit of our lives, right? And everything that's in the mass should be leading up to oriented towards that communion, right? So I, I focus on a, a range of different writers, some of them far outside the, yeah. the Catholic sort of milieu. And, and you even include some who were raised in the Christian faith, but became outright atheists like Chekhov. Yes, yeah, so Ch Chekhov, you know, in the story that I take a look at, the bishop, right? He himself is a kind of agnostic humanist, meaning Chekhov. Mm -hmm. Um, and he reduces, as Pope Benedict said that a lot of people did in Chekhov's time, right? He reduces Jesus to a moral teacher. No more salvation. Christ doesn't come to save us in Chekhov's imagination. He came to teach us this kind of moral and ethical code, right? Yeah. Um, but again, in this story, the bishop, he narrates the divine liturgy, in this case, because the story takes place in Russia, and he does so in one of the most mesmerizing stream of, streams of prose that I've come across that depicts the liturgy, right? It's, it's, it, 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 it draws you in, that you would, it would make you want to go to Mass. But the bishop himself loves the, the sort of smells and bells, but when his niece comes to him asking him for money, he keeps saying, I'll do it tomorrow. Yes, of course I'll help you, I'll do it tomorrow. Yes, of course I'll help you, I'll do it tomorrow. And then he falls ill. And by the time he dies, he continues to promise his niece that he's going to sort of give her something, but he never does, right? Mm -hmm. And so there you go, and you have that sort of that ending that I think is Chekhov's challenge to us, right? You could say, well, he's sort of making fun of Christianity, showing that Christians don't really love their neighbors. But another way of looking at it is, again, couldn't all of us end up like that bishop? Like, I'll get to that tomorrow, that work of mercy that I was going to practice, going to the nursing home, I'll do that tomorrow. Mm -hmm. you know, tomorrow never comes, right? So it sort of shocks, as Pope Benedict says, sometimes art needs to shock us out of ourselves, mm -hmm. right, to, to see the good that we have left undone. And even someone like Chekhov 
or, or even Flaubert. I, I also devote a chapter to Flaubert, who um, imagines, and this is one of the am amazing things about the human imagination, is that Christians can imagine in, through their characters what it would be like to be an atheist, right? And the sort of the, the shallowness of that world and the, the way in which that world would be so much devoid of so, ma so much goodness and truth, right? And atheists, like Flaubert, he described himself as a mystic who believes in nothing, right? But in this story, The Simple Heart, he has this um, just very moving meditation on a simple French peasant woman who loves a lot and loves a number of children and is abused her whole life, but she never loses her faith. And at the end of the story, she, in a kind of senile state, mistakes her pet parrot for the Holy Spirit. And Flaubert's friends all thought that he was satirizing her, mocking her in an ironic way that we were kind of talking about earlier. Sure. The kind that David Foster Wallace, the postmodern novelist, says that this is the kind of irony that is sort of biting, and it's, he says, it's for emergency use only, right, irony. And when you use it habitually, over time, it becomes a, tr a cage that you're trapped in because everything is potentially something that you can make fun of, even sacred things like the Holy Spirit. And Flaubert's friends thought that he was mocking the Holy Spirit and mocking this woman, but he said, absolutely, you, mis you misread the story entirely. I, I was moved to tears through following this character, right? And so it's amazing that even though in his moral life, right, there, he was nothing, to, he had nothing to brag about. In yeah. his spiritual life, he had left Catholicism behind, but in his imaginative stories, he gave us this really compelling picture of a simple woman, right? And uh, I think this is uh, something that when we read this literature, we can feel the, the, the pathos that of someone who still had this love of the beauty of the faith and the liturgy mm -hmm. and yet couldn't make an act of faith mm -hmm. and is sort of left mm. is somewhat hanging mm -hmm. in some, some cases. You've, I've, I've in, in reading some authors, have felt that you know, pathos in them. It's all, uh, it makes me feel bad for them that they can't go mm. that last step they need mm. to make an act of faith, mm -hmm. whereas others mm -hmm. do. And, ex and uh, I, I think um, an author that a lot of people are very familiar with from movie and literature is uh, the uh, Lord of the Rings uh, author, Tolkien. And, yeah. Tolkien. and you know how he was very much a practicing Catholic, yes. and he used his Catholic imagination mm. to create mm. a whole world, mm -hmm. yes, and and a story of salvation. Mm -hmm. That's not an allegory because mm -hmm. right. Tolkien didn't really like allegories. Right. It's it's. It's another yeah. kind of literature. Yeah, and what he also did, as, as, and, and to, the, to the scandal of some, right, was he looked at these pagan cultures and he tried to see the virtues in them, right? So the northern mythologies. Right. Uh, he saw these men who conceived of themselves as totally doomed, right? They didn't have Christian revelation, and yet they heroically went out and risked their lives fighting Grendel, right, fighting these monsters, right, with under this, the auspices of, of not having any hope. And so for a Catholic, you could say, well, if they didn't have hope and they were willing to be that heroic and grow in that kind of courage, right, what about us, sure. right? Yeah, now, I, I, another thing just in terms of, of literature that uh, is worth mentioning, right, is that there could be an objection just sort of raised to whether it's good at all. And I think that that's, 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 that's an objection that's, that's worth entertaining because one of the first places that we find it is in St. Augustine. Mm -hmm. In his confessions, right, he recounts that he would go to these stage plays and he would get so wrapped up in the pains and the sorrows of these characters. I think he says in City of God that if, if, this, if these stories would not leave him kind of weeping by the end of the night, he would go and complain and ask for his money back, right? Like, what, what you know, you're not doing your job. Um, and so he made this kind of hard and fast division because he saw that he was caring about these fictional characters, 
right, what Tolkien would maybe call a secondary world, right, sure. more than the, the primary world, mm -hmm. which is, right, for Tolkien, you're supposed to go into the secondary world to kind of cleanse your palate and to restore your, your re to be re-enchanted again with the wonder of being and all that is. Yeah. And then you return to the world as it, as, as it is, right, mm -hmm. with this sort of re refreshment. Um, but in the case of Augustine, because his appetites were disordered at this time, right, he, he, he took, he found too much delight and pleasure in other people's pains and other people's sufferings, even while he was totally oblivious, right, to his own, to his own sufferings and mm -hmm. to his own sinfulness. Um, so sometimes, you know, literature can play that role. It can be a, more of a, a, a sort of a, uh, screen between us and ourselves or it can can kind of take us out of ourselves in a bad way that becomes just mere entertainment or diversion yeah. right um, and then another interesting kind of objection to especially expressing the divine in literature is that the imagination itself you know could be maybe an obstacle so I oftentimes speak of this in terms of the difference between a Carmelite approach to the imagination and an Ignatian approach to the imagination. Mm -hmm. And the Catholic Church is broad enough that it can house both, amazingly, even though they're very different. So How do you see that difference between the Carmelite imagination and Jesuit yeah. Ignatian? Yeah, so St. John of the Cross, St. Teresa of Avila, right, in, in, in all of their works, whenever the imagination comes up, because they're advising souls who are trying to climb this uh, ascetical way, and what I mean by that is they're sort of cleansing their senses, right? They advise that you should just not trust anything that your imagination shows you because you have to sort of totally strip yourselves of all sensory experience. Mm -hmm. And as St. Teresa of Avila puts it, you know, the things that come in the imagination could be from God, but they also could be from the devil. And she says, because you don't know, you should just strip yourself of it, right? And, but the reason is not for some sort of, you know, sort of sadistic <laughs> approach, but rather because her goal is to help the soul reach total union with God, right? To reach that sort of full union. And that can only happen when the soul is totally naked in the sense that they're stripped of, 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 even, of even something that God gave us that's good, which is the imagination. Mm -hmm. and, and then on the other side, on the Ignatian uh, approach, as you know far better than I, Right. I mean, in, in the spiritual exercises, Ignatius advises us to enter imaginatively into all the particulars of the gospel scenes. Right. Mm -hmm. So when we're thinking about the nativity, we should be remembering that there's the tail of a cow going like this back and forth and it's hitting Jesus in the face. Right. Or I'm, I'm, I'm exaggerating a little bit, but like the, you have to you sure. have to understand that this that there's this mud there and there are these smells. Right. And that right, there could be uh, objectors would say, well, but you're not gonna get it historically accurately, right? You know, you're gonna imagine Jesus in a way that he doesn't, didn't really look like when he was alive. But for Ignatius, the imagination is important enough that he would rather risk sort of historical inaccuracy because the imaginative, you know, those images that you're bringing to mind, what do they do? They establish communion, right, mm -hmm. between you and God in that moment. So in both cases, the Carmelite way and the Ignatian way, the goal is union with God. It's just one in one, one sense, it's through right. images and metaphors. In one sense, right. it's sort of stripping yourself of both of those, yeah. And, and this is something that um, uh, affects people in different ways. I, I, I'll never forget a line by the famous movie director, Alfred Hitchcock. Yeah who had gone to a Jesuit school mm. in England, mm. and he, he said in an interview in Time magazine, I acquired my sense of the macabre from the Jesuits. <laughs> and it came from mm. these vivid imaginative pictures of hell mm. that they talked about in retreats because in the mm. exercises of St. Ignatius of Loyola, there is a meditation on hell, what, yes. imagine yourself being in hell. Yes. And we've certainly had, um, you know, literary pictures of hell, Dante, Absolutely. of course, yeah. and, and others mm -hmm. who uh, have done that. But it, it, it give, getting that imaginative sense, you know, mm. also lends mm. oneself 
to writing mm -hmm. more imaginatively. Mm -hmm. That's right. I mean, so let's let's take the the Catholic dogma of hell, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's indisputable, right? It's yes. it's true, but not fun. For, but no, it's Jesus, not. our Lord was very clear on its existence. Yes, and it's, it's not fun. And so when you read these accounts of the saints, right, giving you these sort of vivid imaginative details of what hell looks like with all of its, right, sort of telling on duty details that you'd rather sort of turn away, you know, you would rather not look at it. But it, it convinces us, right, doesn't it? It persuades us mm -hmm. of its existence more than maybe just reading the dogmatic expression of it would. Right, so sure. it, it it appeals to again our senses. See, that that's exactly right, and it it helps. To, you know, when you read Dante's, uh, you know, Inferno, which sadly is often the only part of Dante that <laughs> the <truth>. <laughs> literature classes <laughs> have the students read. Mm -hmm. um, now maybe the says something about the expectations of the teachers mm -hmm. for eternal life <laughs> for themselves <laughs> and or mm -hmm. their students. But, mm -hmm. uh, you know, he does give an imaginative understanding of hell. And this is one of the great purposes of literature mm -hmm. so that you can say, mm -hmm. you know, I can see myself in some of these characters who end up in hell. Yes, absolutely. And I don't want to. Yeah, absolutely. I don't want to be there. Yeah, I, you know, and that which is Dante's purpose. Yeah, I mean, and Dante's Divine Comedy is also really instructive in that the main sort of lesson that he needs to learn, the main conversion that he needs to undergo throughout the story, is a movement away from a kind of over easy sentimental uh, understanding of pity, right, mm -hmm. and he needs to have that corrected into what he calls misericordia, which is a kind of just mercy, as St. Thomas Aquinas would put it, right? Mm -hmm. So, and he does that, he, he, he passes through that journey in the way that you just sort of described, which is, as, as, as Lynch puts it, right, you, you, you don't sacrifice any of the density and the thickness of the real, right? You pass through all of these particulars uh, you don't try to take a shortcut to get to heaven, right? You right. pass through these very sort of mundane realities in order to move up into insight is mm -hmm. the way that, that Lynch puts it. And that's exactly sort of the shape of the, the divine comedy. And, and oh, yeah, sorry, go ahead. ahead. Yeah, so, I mean, in, in the case of, right, the divine comedy, Dante begins his his journey in a very bad way, right? Sort of when he encounters these two illicit lovers, Paolo and Francesca in hell, he feels so bad for them because he thinks that they're wrongfully treated, that God's punishment is not just, mm -hmm. right? And part of the reason for that is that he himself is, uh, is, is af affected by that lust, right? Yeah. But he's able to slowly be purged of right. that sort of affection by the end of the poem. Yeah, he, he's going through conversion because he's got uh, joy in some of his former enemies being in hell. He does. Um, including one of the popes. So this is something there, but it's, um, yeah, this, this is good, good stuff to, to I want to encourage you to, again, get this book. Um, it's called How to Read and Write Like a Catholic by Joshua Wren. You can get it at EWTNRC.com, or it's item number 8667. And I would, um, and the publishing company is called WisebloodBooks.com. And I'd encourage you to read literature with this Catholic perspective yeah. that Joshua is, is teaching. So, very great thing. Thank you very oh, much, thank you so much for Father. being with us. I'm afraid that we've pretty much run out of time. <laughs> sure. Uh, but thank you very um, much. And may the Lord bless you all and keep you and cause his face to shine upon you. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. You know, we can bring Joshua and all the other guests and have all the other programs that we have only because... This network is brought to you by you. Mother Angelica felt inspired to have it run this way, no commercials and such. So 
please remember to keep us in between your gas bill, your electric bill, and your cable bill. And if you do that, we'll be able to pay our bills too. God bless you and thank you.